So this is a, a special edition. Because it's two days before Christmas, we thought it would be a really interesting idea to have two experts on the Christian story of Christmas and the pagan animist story of Christmas. So we're joined by Elizabeth Oldfield of Theos Think Tank and Runa Rasmussen. Rune Rasmussen. Elizabeth, if you'd like to, to begin to unmute yourself and what is what is the deeper story of Christmas? Hi. Um, I just see all your faces. Um, yes. So I run a Christian-based religion think tank, which does a lot of social commentary and analysis. But tonight I'm just going to speak very straightforwardly as a Christian um, about the weirdness of Christian for me, of Chris, Christmas for me. And as I've been preparing this, I have come to the conclusion I don't even think Christmas is a Christian festival, or at least it isn't the way we celebrate it now. And it wasn't even part of the church calendar until 395 or thereabouts, which is post-Constantine. And then quite an arbitrary date was chosen. And for many centuries, it was at the backwater of the church calendar, Easter, All Souls Day, Epiphany, all these things were um, very central. And there's been a few people throwing around questions about whether in this lockdown, when we thought we would in the UK get um, a relaxation of the COVID restrictions for Christmas, whether this was a privileging of Christianity. And sometimes in the UK, Christians are privileged. But I don't think that's what was happening here. Because if you look at the other things that were privileged uh, this Christmas, or rather the festivals that were protected, there were VE Day, Remembrance Sunday, and Christmas. And these are the high points of a kind of civic Christianity, the kind of national identity that are trying to root us in a very stable, nationalist, kind of ordered, respect for authority narrative, which I think is hugely ironic when you actually look at the uh, biblical texts about the nativity, which are in fact highly political, status upending almost anarchic, spiky, challenging texts, not about order and not about coziness or consumerism or a kind of faint Victorian charity at all. And I have this real cognitive dissonance every Christmas because it feels like we're trying to celebrate multiple festivals at once. There's like archaeological layers in this festival. We have uh, the festival that I know very little about and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Rune on, which is from what I know, something about the turning of the year and the seasons and light and dark and, and you know, the unchanging nature in some ways of these rhythms of our lives. And then we have this very cosy, domestic, very consumer led kind of Victorian slash American invention, which is about comfort and retreat and treating ourselves and then poking up. And the picture I had was like the jagged green leaves of crocuses in a snowy garden. You have these very angular, very odd, very political Middle Eastern narratives, the biblical nativity, the birth of a child that Christians believe bled and died to save the world. It's like definitely not cozy, comforting, fair. So I'm just going to say really a little bit about those narratives. And some of you will be really familiar um, with the Bible. Lots of you won't. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the New Testament starts with four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And you can think of them as like um, four filmmakers tackling the same life in a biopic. It is the life of Jesus done in four really quite different ways, you know, focusing on different details, going after different audiences and two of them don't include the nativity uh, narratives at all. They go straight to Jesus in his adult phase. And Mark, which is the earliest gospel, doesn't go there. It goes straight for um, uh, Jesus's adult ministry. And when you go back and read them, as I, I was doing so today, and there's a good like chunky couple of chapters in both of them, um, in Matthew and in Luke, when you blow off the dust of the like over familiarity of the Christmas card image that we have of them, they are just not what we expect. They are not, they're really quite different from the kind of cultural echo that we received. There's no three kings. There's an unspecified number of major, some of which might have been women. There's no stable. We just infer that from the fact that Jesus was laid in a manger. And the, the political backdrop to them, the very powerful um, context, which is utterly stripped out of our modern celebrations of Christmas, is 
the politics. These are very early attempts at historical writing. Um, they're not like modern historical writing, but they are clear, clearly not mythic writing. They are trying to ground these stories in events that would have still been in the memory of those who were living when these were written some, or at least we think they were written decades later. So they're trying to ground them in historical events. And this historical writing, in ways that is almost unheard of in the ancient world, was not historical writing about those at the center of power. It was quite the opposite. It, it was almost entirely unknown in the ancient world for the voices and the lives and the details and the challenges and the pressures of the most marginalized, the most distant from power to be recorded. And it made me think about how at the moment we have this revolution in publishing because we're realizing even now in the 21st century, we are terrible at listening to the voices of those uh, of low status, of those far from the center of power, of those who are not in the minority. This is not a new problem. So it was radical then, it's radical now, it's even more radical then. And the voices and the stories and the lives that the nativity uh, narratives are, are telling us about are about the Israelites in Palestine. And I'm about to say the sentence, knowing that there are some modern echoes. And the Israelites in Palestine at the time were an occupied and oppressed minority. And they were heavily controlled because of outbreaks of essentially guerrilla warfare, of sabotage. Occasionally elsewhere in the New Testament, you find these references to the zealots. And they were, um, the Romans would have called them terrorists. They would have called themselves freedom fighters. So the air of this, these Christmas stories are, is just thick with political unrest, with rumours of revelation. And that cosy trip to Bethlehem on a little donkey, you know, little donkey, little donkey on a dusty road, is ever so sweet, children sing it. No, it is mass forced movement of people in order to better tax these colonised groups. It's really sinister. After Jesus is born, uh, the the texts record that Herod, King Herod, who is a sort of, um, we think of him as like a comedy villain, particularly from Jesus Christ Superstar, but he is a collaborator with the empire. If you think of him as a sort of Vichy France figure, and he is so spooked by these rumors of a grassroots source of power that he uh, orders a massacre of baby boys and drives that family um, essentially into um, uh, forced migration. They become immigrants and as asylum seekers. And that, that baby is brown, poor, is almost certainly illiterate, the son of a manual laborer and an unmarried teenage mother. He gets swept up in this, you know, uh, um, forced movement across borders right in the area that we now hear most about because of the migrant crisis. And the bit I love, obviously, is that he's welcomed into the world by a mother. The text records a woman's experience, a woman's emotions, and a woman's words. And I cannot stress again how unusual this is in writings from the ancient Near East. And it's not only her experience, you know, we think of uh, meek Mary wrapped in a blue, then gazing beatifically at Jesus. And, you know, she's just this wholesome virgin. If you read the Magnificat, no, this is a radical political text. This woman has a voice. I'm going to quote you four lines from it. She's worshipping God and she says, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is a woman who is railing against injustice and she's associating this baby with a world turned upside down. Um, if you've seen Hamilton, you'll know the song. It's gonna be in your head now for the rest of the evening as it is in mine. And yes, it was sung in the American um, War of Independence, but it was also sung, it was written in the English Civil War and it was about Christmas. It was about Christmas turning the world upside down and the battle over the celebration of this festival and the excesses of the rich. I just think that Christmas has always been like quietly a stealth political festival and it's been more obvious at different parts in at different seasons of history than others. But what it means is that for those of us who are Christians, 
it's so, it's so hard to hold all that in our heads whilst we're decorating the tree, frantically running around buying presents that people probably don't want or need and are going to get regifted and, you know, eating too much food and watching the John Lewis Christmas advert. And it, it, it's, it's like living in, in two realities at once. It's really discombobulating. And actually the only time of Christmas where it really comes together to me, these, these traditions and the heart of the thing is during the festival of nine lessons and carols. And I don't know if that's a thing in, in other countries, I'd love to hear from you later, but it's a sort of very traditional high Anglican um, service that is done during Advent and it's nine, nine carols, as you mentioned, but nine, nine scripture readings. And what that does is it sets these weird political stories in the broader sweep of the narrative of scripture and then they can make sense you know it starts with genesis and the psychological realism of genesis is amazing if you've not read those first few chapters go back and read them for what it tells us about human nature that we make poor choices and when we make poor choices we're triggered into shame and when we're triggered into shame we're tri triggered into blame and that blame uh, alienates us and distances us from the divine and from each other and that creates a downward spiral of poor choices and entropy, <laughs> uh, slow burn, civilizational collapse, which it feels like we're um, still living in. And that's the kind of setup. And then you've got the Hebrew Bible with, which was really O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, all the way through. This is longing for justice, this rumors that justice will come, that restoration, that reconciliation will come. And then you get, uh, then you get, the very political, weird nativity stories of, of, of that hope coming, but then it doesn't stop there. It goes on to Easter, it goes on to um, Revelation, to a world fully remade at the end of time. And then, and then I can kind of put all the parts together in my head in a way that um, is, is livable with. But the way we celebrate it now is we wrestle these uh, tiny tidbits of scripture from their context. It feels like we plonk them on a platter with the sprouts and the pigs in blankets, which are the UK's things. And, and we try and shove them down with everything else that's happening at Christmas. This mysterious and for me compelling and extraordinary idea of the incarnation of God going on a rescue mission right into the heart of the human experience to restore us because he loves us. It's just like thrown in there and covered in tinsel. And it's no wonder that it's indigestible and we can't really get our heads around it. Um, so those are some of my uh, confused thoughts about some of the Christian uh, origins of Christmas. Awesome, thank you, Elizabeth. So if, if anyone has any thoughts or questions that come up while listening to Elizabeth or listening to Rune, if you want to, you can jot them into the chat and I'll uh, get them transcribed and then we can come back to them at the end of the, the session. So Rune, would you like to take it away with the animist pagan history of Christmas? I'm working, I'm a historian of religion. I'm, I'm working on rejected animist culture in our North European cultural history. Um, and I call this, Nordic animism uh, and the idea is as that as we North Europeans or I'm not just saying we <laughs> but as uh, Westerners became modern we start which started trying to convince ourselves for instance that there isn't a spirit in a tree and we're not really completely successful in making this case to ourselves but we believe that we are and then we stop sort of engaging the tree the tree in ways that, for instance, acknowledge them as persons. Uh, and that is uh, the movement away from animism. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in looking back into these traditional culture to find, for instance, less destructive ways of relating to the world than the quite catastrophic uh, ones that our present management of the world. Right. So on Yule or Christmas, culturally, I'm speaking sort of from a Scandinavian perspective because that I'm from, where, that's where I'm from and what I'm mainly looking at. But I think these principles that I'm about to talk about actually apply throughout Northern Europe and, and perhaps more of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, particularly, for instance, like England, uh, which in many ways is kind of part of the sort of the Nordic, North European culture space, right? And yeah, when we look at Christmas or Yule from an animist perspective, the dark time of year is 
totally the, the ritual center of gravity of the year. The Christmas period, like in, in agrarian society, was almost like, like um, the ignition point or the, 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 uh, the bottom of the year where the good functionality of the rest of the year was sort of worked into place. And uh, this uh, importance of this period has also meant that Christmas has a quite high level of sort of inertia in the traditions. It is as if Christmas is sort of culturally quite conservative. Uh, it, it does things from earlier periods. Earlier periods. Like one example is that here in, in Denmark, where I'm from, People still sometimes make these little offerings of porridge to these house spirits. Uh, and it's just kind of a game, but a very archaic and non-modern thing to do. Even the queen does it as this public thing. She's like the head of the Church of Denmark, actually performing what's essentially heathen right. And this is, this is a, a, an expression of this weird, yeah, Conservatism not the right word, but it's almost like a time bubble. And you also see this in, in, in Christmas behaviors that we just think of as like a natural way of be, being around Christmas, like getting very drunk at the specific times around Christmas. This is ancient. Also, New Year's resolutions. It's a kind of culture that's attested in sagas, where people would lay oaths about stuff that they were going to do in the coming year. Ancient, but also something that we probably don't think about as particularly ancient. And it seems that Christmas always had this sort of time bubble nature around it. Um, when the kings of Norway uh, made the country uh, Christian, the sagas tell us that Odin, who uh, was considered the god of the Yule Christmas period, tended to return around Christmas and to try to lure these sort of Christian kings back into his sway. Um, and uh, yeah, and Christ Christmas is, is therefore very dense with lots of different kinds of ritual. Uh, there are purifications. There are carnivalesque behavior. There's different complex handlings of alcohol. There's a specific gallery of spirit-like fi figure, often these dark, even demonic figures. There's masquerading of these figures, omen-taking, a general idea of proximity to the other world, even shamanic practices, ritual blessings of the coming year. And there's like this deluge of, of pecu peculiarities, like mirroring, for instance, between uh, traditions of, of Christmas and, uh, and of, of Midsummer. But what I actually think is important when you look at Christmas from an animist perspective is not only Christmas itself, but, but the way it's connected to the rest of the year. When, when, uh, when you look at these rituals, then um, uh, or take this animist perspective on folklore then, uh, and popular religiosity, then it seems that the important thing is often the relation between the points more than just the point itself. So, uh, so I, I want to take one example of this and just to try to exemplify Christmas as related to the rest of, of, of the year and how people used to ritually handle the year. And the, the example is the produce of harvest. And, and I'm going to be, begin in March. In March, people uh, used to save, uh, have saved some of the best harvest of the year, some of the best barley, for instance. And they would create a specific kind of beer out of this, which was called the beer of Thor month. Now, March used to be called Thor month in uh, southern Scandinavia. This beer would then be saved throughout spring and summer period where people believe that thunder came and ripened the cross, crops. And through spring, there were these like sometimes uh, very sexual rituals to kick off the growth of the, of the, of the produce. People would sometimes uh, actually have sexual intercourse and mix the semen from these ritual in intercourse into the seeds used for sowing and stuff like that. Around late July, there's a day called St. Olaf's Day, and that was in Scandinavia. That was a critical point where people who were waiting for the first harvest to arrive. Now, St. Olaf was sort of identified with the god Thor through a similar logic that you see in religions like voodoo and Santeria, where like afro religions, where saints are equated with, with deities. And when the first harvest came, then the, this four-month beer that was brewed in March would be opened in an offering or kind of a celebration. Sometimes a ram would be slaughtered, these kind of things. Um, as the first sheath uh, arrived, I, I believe it's called sheath in English, a kind of collection of corn. Um, and that first sheaf, sheaf, sheaf uh, would be uh, personified into a deity. And again, here there was a sexual symbolism around it. There are case, cases where it could be made into a male deity and then brought to the, the, the lady of the house and have actually 
um, uh, symbolic intercourse uh, with the lady of the house, then this sheaf of corn would be made into a, uh, a bread. And this bread would be shared between harvest workers in an almost uh, sacramental way. Um, after, of course, that the lady of the house had ritually given birth to this bread, almost as like an, an enactment of the mystery of life coming out of, of the earth. Now, this kind of a bread or a sheaf could then be brought on through the year or saved through the year for Christmas. Um, and uh, for instance, last sheaves were also personified into deity-like figures, as if you, people want to personify the produce of the of the harvest. You see this in different cultures as well. The Maya, for instance, they they personify the maize as a deity, and and this uh, last sheaf. Uh, could then be saved for Christmas and given as an offering to the wild hunt, an idea of that there was a procession of wild and monstrous beings that were believed to roam through the land around Christmas, or uh, this last sheaf could be used to making Christmas beer. And this is really important because in old days, Yule Christmas, that was something you drank. You didn't celebrate Yule, you drank Yule. Uh, and it is as if the, 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 when you take some of the last sheaf um, and some of the, 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 the best barley, and you condense it into beer, it is as if you are kind of wanting to distill the, almost the spirit of the earth, and that actually becomes the spirit of Christmas. Um, and this was also sometimes personified with a masquerading figure of sorts. Uh, before Christianity, it might have been the god Odin again, uh, but in later times, there were all different kinds of witches and the Yule goat and, and all different kind of people, typically beings that were made or masked with, with, with some of the straw of the harvest. For instance, the Yule goat in Scandinavia, the mask of the Yule goat is typically made with straw. So it makes sort of a chimera, a mixed being between goat and harvest, perhaps. Um, and these masquerading traditions of course, also typically had an aspect of eroticism, a lot of sexual play around these uh, performances, sexual non-normative aspects, transdressing and these kind of things. And the Christmas beer uh, that was also sort of part of this personification of the spirit of Yule Christmas. I, I, I'm using these two words a little bit interchangeably. Uh, in my own language, it's the same words. We just say Yule. But um, uh, this would... Uh, this idea that Yule is something you drink, of course, means that the intoxication is almost in a physical sense that you become Christmas itself somehow. Uh, and there are ancient myths also where Odin, uh, the, the god of Yule, comes to a Christian king and then he brings a horn that contains the power of the heathen Yule inside it. And the Christian king of Norway then shows, asserts his Christianity by rejecting it. Um, and of course, this really also, uh, a part of it was also that these old drinking toasting customs were appropriated into Christianity. So people would toast Christian figures during the Yule drinking. So they would toast Jesus and Mary and Saint Thorlock and no, whatever weird medieval saints they had in those days. Um, and this is some about, actually, I think this is part of the reason that many countries in Northern Europe, Europe people still get drunk around Christmas. Um, the beer is Christmas. It's the essence of, har essence of harvest, the sustenance of life, the essence of the sustenance of life almost. Um, and, but harvest could also then be used in baking specific Christmas breads or cakes and stuff, often with these old weird designs, wheels or spirals or even swastika-like figures. Uh, and they were then placed on a Christmas altar. And the Christmas candles that were made in specific ritual ways were then supposed to shine on them, which again mirrors the way that the midsummer pyres were supposed to shine on and bless the fields uh, in, during summer. And these kind of sacred breads could be eaten or they could be given in offerings to a sacred tree or a sacred mound or an ancient burial mound or to the wild hunt or to poor people. This thing about gift giving as a sa almost a sacrificial practice is actually found in, in many different uh, kinds of religion. Such breads made as Christmas breads could then also be saved for spring and crumbled into the earth during the sowing. So you see that the harvest sort of goes all the way through the year. There's this almost as if people want to, I don't know, handle the essence of life or the transformation of the essences of life. Like 
seed to corn and corn to bread and and corn to beer and and these are things are given back they are used in exchange with with uh, powers around uh, people yeah so this is one uh, example and aspect of Christmas uh, animism that sort of ties, I think, into the how it sort of ties into the whole year. And but there are many different kind of things I could have chosen: the management of light, fire, candles, this masquerading that I mentioned. Um, one particular uh, important thing that I just want to mention here in the end is the I think interesting relation to Christianity, uh, where uh, which uh, when Elizabeth is talking about uh, Christian Christmas here and how. It's weird for her to actually, or it's difficult for her to actually see uh, biblical Christianity in Christmas. Um, when you look at it sort of from the other side, what you see is a, this very intense merging between Christian imagery and animist logic. And that actually reaches out throughout the year. Even the idea of the birth of Jesus seemed to be merged in with, with these logics of the light returning. A new light is being born. And this is then reflected in, in other Christian holidays in other parts of the year. So, so, so even... It's, it's as if this animist logic where Christmas is sort of the center of gravi gravity is even reflected into Christianity in, in, in certain ways. Right. I hope this wasn't too dense. I'm often uh, sometimes a little bit uh, too ambitious when I'm trying to present things. But uh, this was, uh, this was uh, sort of what I had. I hope it made, made sense. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was really, yeah, your enthusiasm really comes through, Rune. That was fantastic. Um, I'm struck by listening to both of you. The, there's something subversive about the, the, both of the stories you told in different ways, like the subversive nature of the Festival of Yule and the subversive nature of the true Christian story that I'd love to, to unpack a little bit more, maybe either now or in the second half. But I'd love if, if Elizabeth, if you wanted to ask Rune a question or the other way around, we'll kind of open it up for a little dialogue before we go into the breakouts. Yeah, um, I have two, but maybe I'll start with one. Uh, one is that the thing I didn't really have time to say was that pre uh, really the 19th century, Christ Christmas, again, wasn't like a huge high point of the Christian calendar, but what the day tended to be marked by this sort of lords of misrule, um, those of lower status being able to, you know, demand food from the head of the manor or dressing up like a fool and in the officer's mess, the officers would serve the men. There was a lot of this like flipping of power hierarchies happening. And to the extent that in the um, the late 1800s in America, there was a Christmas day riot, this, this kind of like drinking and carousing day got completely out of control. And that some historians think is what drove this like almost this pacifying of Christmas of trying to tame it and domesticate it to be much more domestic and yeah I just would love to hear Rune's reflection on that and I, what I'm wondering is if we you can get to that more anarchic thing from both sources that I'd always assumed maybe that was a pagan leftover but now that I'm actually paying more attention to the biblical text I'm like well that feels pretty Christian too in that not not possibly the like riot but <laughs> the, the questioning of um power and hierarchy what do you think yeah, I think I think you got something there. And, and by the way, let me just say thanks a lot for your presentation. I super enjoyed uh, your uh, your sort of the other Christianity of Christmas perspective there. Um, yeah, let me think. I think that this carnivalesque aspect is very uh, it's very characteristic of of Christmas. And uh, from my knowledge of my own culture in Northern Europe, it's as if it is just there and it's very difficult to really, I don't, it's almost undomesticatable. Like, like you, you have the behavior that for in the Dane, Danes, I'm Danish, the Danes also have the cozy family sort of bourgeois Christmas, but then there is a New Year's Eve, which is very wild and crazy. And then there is uh, Christmas lunches, which are typically uh, in people's offices and the, in their companies and so on, which are also very sort of wild things where people kind of have, have sex with the people they weren't supposed to have sex with and, and kind of 
take 200 copies of their own bot on the uh, office copying machine and all these kind of crazy things. And and this sort of behavior, um, I think it is it, it it's deeply attached to the the idea of tran, um, a transition between years. That in the deepest darkness, uh, there uh, there is a sense of closeness to the other world, and that sense of closeness comes with a host of these sort of perspe- uh, ideas of. For instance, purification, that people, uh, there's something dangerous, monstrous, or inverted that sort of comes close. But then after that happens, then people also need to sort of purify it again. And, and often it's as if Christmas also or, often or almost need to be scared away again after it was there. Um, and I think there are, um, from, from the Christian perspective specifically, uh, I think that you you should probably look in the in the process in which Christianity sort of uh, went into the Roman Empire and went into synergy with some of the things that were there already, like the uh, Sol Invictus of the um, Mithraic religion, which I think might be the, the predecessor of our our present Christmas on the twenty fifth, uh, and some of these Saturnalia uh, celebrations that have sort of um, um, have been there and might have been or also be part of the 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 legacy that we have in our contemporary Christmas. Um, but but I, as I recall, I think that sort of the ritual from a ritual perspective, uh, I think that Christianity, when it sort of consolidated in, in Europe, it didn't it didn't bring with it a lot of ritual. So that's something that has sort of emerged in the meeting with, with uh, yeah, uh, Roman and, and other religions where, where it came. So, so to what extent, for instance, the carnivalesque aspect uh, from the ritual point of view as Christian, I'm not sure. That makes sense. I don't know. The, uh, but what you're so- talking about, that is, also, that is also like really raw sort of, yeah, politically subversive realities, of course. Uh, in the narrative itself. Mm. Why do you think that the, because it, as I was trying to pull apart these strands, I was like, they are really quite different things going on here. I loved what you were saying about the different rituals that are kind of taming, engaging with nature, really thinking about the circle of life. And then there's this narrative, which is really about the interruption of the cycles of t- endless time ongoing, that there is a, you know, th- the transcendent divine comes into history and interrupts the course of history and, and is not, you know, the divine in the world around us or, or not in such an emphasized way, but the, the divine in human form that we can know. They're like, and it's almost like a Venn diagram. We've got sort of cr- Christian Christmas doctrine and animist and pagan. And then, and then as the two overlap, we've got this accretion of this bizarre combo that has endured in weird forms down the centuries, but we've we've kind of not gone fully either way culturally. Mm. Why do you think we live in that tension? I actually think it's because uh, I think we are like that as humans. <laughs> I mean, we run around thinking that we are Christians or animists or moderns or socialists or whatever we think we are, but we are really multi-layered layer things that, uh, and, and I think our culture is also like that. So, so uh, and this is why you find, for instance, these, like, you know, when, when you look at sources and sometimes stark, 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 uh, contradictions between what the sources says and the and the celebration actually is. And I, by the way, I also love you. You were talking about uh, Christmas uh, in a video I saw where you you were speaking that Davids and where you were talking about their different Christmases. And the root of the word Yule uh, is actually plural. That it actually means Yules. There's more than one. And I think that that. Is also something that never changed. The, the, I think that Yule, in when you look at Yule at a Norwegian prim start from the 17th century, and when you look at the Yule period in uh, your Google Calendar, you will probably see the same, and that is that a lot of different stuff is happening, uh, and and these these things are not necessarily like one. They all, they also don't follow the same sort of perhaps ritual or mythological logic. Perhaps you meet with group of old friends that you 
knew from from school on the second uh, Advent Sunday or something. That's just a tradition that you have, but it doesn't really have anything to do with Advent. Do you say Advent in English as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, so there's this total plurality of it. And that is perhaps in itself carnivalesque and perhaps why Christmas, and, and I, I would suspect, you know, no, I, I think Christmas probably has more of that than, than other holidays around the year, probably more than Easter. Uh, yeah, it's definitely the most hybrid moment of the year, I think. Yeah, <laughs> extremely hybrid, yeah. <laughs> I am... Um... I wonder what about the Christian Christmas, if anything, is most appealing to you. I know all the things about Yule that sound really fun, and I am drawn to. Um, what is most appealing to me about Christmas, Christian Christmas? I actually never thought about that. Well, uh, also because, <laughs> well, I really liked your description of Christian Christmas and this whole thing about you almost get images of, of uh, like people trying to get across the Mediterranean in boats. And it is that kind of, uh, that kind of situation, which is really the, the, uh, the birth of God. I, I think I like the radicalism of that. I like the radicalism of, of what you described and the, the sort of uh, the uh, transgressive and uh, uh, sort of border breaking uh, nature of that thing. Um, yeah. So Sharon asked, what about the significance of the nativity re-Christianity as an essentially incarnation spirituality? And I, I was reminded, Elizabeth, in your talk to Perspectiva, you talked about how the true idea of God becoming incarnate is one that's too big for, it's certainly too big for, for, for children, it's almost too big for, for, for adults to understand. So I'd love to, I'd love if you could kind of outline that maybe for us yeah I mean I didn't get to say much about it mainly because I think it's really buried in our the way we celebrate Christmas at the moment but I think the reason it is in two of the gospels is to really underline this incredibly strange claim that Jesus was fully human and fully God and you know used the toilet and sweated and had friends and <laughs> probably drank beer and bread and ate bread and you know and yet was it continued to be somehow part of slash the creator of the universe and the holder of history and that the, the way that the Christianity's claim about the imminent and the transcendent coming together in Jesus and that reconciling moment that what whatever we understand to have happened on the cross, some, you know, for Christians, something happened at least, um, is obviously for me completely compelling. And it's why that the strange, you know, the strange, one of the things I didn't mention is that, you know, it's a baby. It's not just the kind of brown, poor, illiterate, <laughs> you know, and with women's voices in there, it's the most vulnerable, most exposed moment of a human life in which God is revealing himself, herself, they self, however, however you want to go about it. And so I, I, I certainly feel that we do a huge disservice to the mysterious, compelling doctrine of the incarnation which i sometimes say is you know it's from the same root as chili con carne it's god with meat on it's a fle fleshly god it's just this paradox um but we just bury it under you know stars and wrapping paper um i would, I would genuinely like to like wrestle it out of christmas and put it somewhere else in the year and like give myself time to sit and ponder that beautiful thing Hmm. but that might not have been what the question meant i'm sorry if it wasn't yeah no the, the, the that idea what would it look like if you wrestled it out of christmas where would you put it i mean this is where i think christianity and the animist and pagan traditions 
do part ways in that I don't I don't I don't think there's like an obvious place in the calendar that I want to sort of mush together with it because there happens to be a you know the trees are shedding their leaves and therefore we think about just I think I just want to not be trying to think about it whilst I'm trying to think about so many other things and maybe January maybe in the stillness and the waiting and the um yeah the waiting for the coming is which is what advent is supposed to be and gets completely we were saying in our group that it used to be fasting and sitting in the dark and waiting for the light to come and then feasting and rejoicing at the good news that the love of god has come to us but christmas has just like slid backwards and takes up all of advent and we just feast from like october by the time we actually get to christmas everyone's just exhausted and it's quite looking forward to dry january and some sort of diet like flip it back over that might help us rune did you have anything to add on this yes i'm unmuted um not not a lot i think i think the 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 mystery of incarnation from a um as elizabeth described it is very I think it's very important for uh, for us or for as modern people. Uh, I think that animist religions uh, or more anim- religions that lean more towards an animist uh, perspective on this exact uh, point, th- I think they would tend to see uh, such incarnation as something that's much more normal, actually. Um, I, I did my uh, my PhD on uh, a kind of Afro-descendant religion, uh, a, a kind of voodoo. Um, and in, in these kind of religions, the incarnation of deities in 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 humanity is is a very everyday like thing that is uh, uh, treated uh, ritually uh, and managed quite intensively ritual ritually. And I think pre-Christian religions would have, and also early Christianity actually would have uh, similar similar sort of ways. When there was an Anglo-Saxon king in England in the Middle Ages, uh, I'm pretty sure that the uh, the peasantry would almost think about that king as a, a, a as a manifestation of god almost um and and also before christianity came uh so i think so i think the and this is not because i want to discredit uh, at all what elizabeth is, say, is saying quite the contrary almost i think i think she's articulating s- some of our of, of our contemporary paradox in relation to some some um some things that are in Christianity being articulated in, in uh, incarnation. Awesome, thank you. So Nisa, 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 Nisha, Nisha is my name. Yeah. Nisha. Nisha. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah. I had a, thank you to both of the speakers. I had a question um, based on Elizabeth's presentation that gets a bit away from um, Christmas, but um, just something I was curious about, partially because it, so related to the pedagogical potential of Genesis. And I was partially curious because I was recently listening to Jordan Peterson's um, lecture series on Genesis. But the question that I asked was, um, how might the blame slash shame spiral you mentioned in Genesis relate to shadow work? Is the downward spiral of negative behavior that you mentioned preventable with self-awareness about that process or tendency? So if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I saw that question earlier and it's fascinating. Thank you so much for it. Um, so I, my understanding of shadow work is patchy. There's a guy called Mark Vernon, who you might like a lot, who writes a lot about the intersection between psychoanalysis and is a psychoanalyst and, um, and theology. And I think he'd say, yes. Uh, I, there's an intersection. I don't know if he'd say it's preventable. I suspect not. And theologically, I would say no that is not preventable. I think anything that brings us to an awareness, essentially of our our brokenness or our need for help is humanizing and helpful. And whether that's in the sacrament of the confession or in therapy, or maybe ideally in both, um, 
all those things are incredibly helpful um and and you know self-awareness makes us and everyone around us better i as a christian the missing ingredient for me would be grace that part of the joy of the thing for me is the actually i believe that with the help of god i can become more human and more alive and more free but it's I need to ask for the help that is beyond me and it's not work that I can fully do myself. Great. Awesome. Um, so if, if you have a follow-up question, um, you, you're welcome to, to ask one follow-up to your question. If you have any other thoughts. Um, so, yeah, I guess just to um, thank you for that for that um answer so just to to clarify the idea being that recognizing that brokenness or you know um incompleteness can be a step towards faith and kind of giving yourself over to it so it can be useful in that in that sense is that what you're saying yeah very much so and actually mark tells a really interesting i interviewed him for a podcast i do called the sacred and he talks about in being able to open himself to an encounter with the divine via therapy because he needed to deal with a lot of the defendedness and the wounds and baggage before he could let love of that kind in. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it, the Christian gospel talks about God as father, which is complicated for a lot of people. <laughs> and some of the reasons we resist that might be because of things that it would be useful to talk about. Um, with a mental health professional. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So Patricia Stimson, would you like to ask your question next? Thank you. Uh, so my question is about, I, I'm very struck by the sentiment of peace on earth, goodwill toward men that is associated with Christmas, that it's very feminine to me. It's very inclusive and non-rivalrous, uh, forgiving, open, welcoming. And, um, you know, then on, it lasts for a little bit on the next week. And then on January 1st, we're back to uh, rivalry and competition and might makes right and all that. Um, so I'm wondering if there is a feminine energy aspect to Christmas in its origin, that, that that is, it's kind of leaking out into our modern world. Do you want to go first, Rune? Yeah, I can. Um, from, from my perspective on the, the traditional knowledge animism uh, around Christmas, uh, there certainly are feminine, uh, feminine uh, aspects around it, uh, but I wouldn't say they're particularly peace, peaceful. Uh, there's the, this aspect of, of these kind of wild and dark uh, goddess-like figures that are associated with magic and stuff like that that are active around Christmas. In uh, in parts of Germany, they have what is called the Perten or the Frau Holle, which is uh, these sort of figures. But the piece uh, that, that, that you mentioned, uh, I think that is a, a fundamental thing that has to do with transition uh, that I think I mentioned before, when there are these transitions, when humans have these transitions, there are often these interim stages that, and they can be wild, they can be carnivalesque, they can be all these sort of subversive things, but there can also be a, a, a feeling that now we enter into a space where there is peace between people and where the normal sort of uh, fighting and of, of uh, human life is sort of set out of um, is pushed aside. And, and that is something that in, in Northern European uh, traditional knowledge has been practiced in different times of year. There used to be a bond of peace. The, uh, the word is frider in, in uh, Old Norse, covering the whole harvest period, for instance, meaning there were no legal co uh, cases whatsoever. Uh, criminals weren't persecuted below a certain level of gravity in this 
period because it was taboo to have any sort of conflict. Uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure there must have been se- uh, similar things around Christmas. Uh, so, so this is, I think, the this sense of peacefulness might be about uh, the transitional thing, something about clearing out all the pollution of a normal year in order to initiate a new year. Thank you. That's such an interesting question. It's making me think of um, my Christmas album of the year that I've listened to on repeat is called The Beautiful Day. And it's Kurt Elling, who's a jazz singer. If you're at all interested in jazz, it's the most extraordinarily beautiful Christmas album. And he has a song called Some Children See Him. And it goes through children see Jesus as they are and all different, you know, colours and races. But right at the end, it says some children see him as a girl. And it always makes me cry because of that sense of, an identification, and I do think that the lead, the the understanding of what authority is and what leadership is, turned very radically around Jesus and this idea of a servant leader who seeks the good of those who follow, a shepherd who protects the flock in this very maternal way. And Jesus says, he looks over Jerusalem and says, "Oh, basically, my chicks, I have gathered you under my wings in this very maternal." gentle, loving when he's not always that. He also is pretty spiky when it comes to challenging authority, but then so is Mary, so can women be. Um, But I do think that the alpha Caesar, Roman king, macho leadership is totally challenged by Christmas and certainly feels like it aligns to me in many ways with the more, um, yeah, feminine energy. Thank you both. Can I just ask what the album was that you were talking about? Elizabeth? It's called The Beautiful Day by Kurt Elling, and it's just gorgeous. We are at time. So just enough time to say thank you so much to Elizabeth and to Rune for sharing There's some really beautiful moments there, and it felt really informative. And, yeah, the, got a sense of, like, the richness of both kind of the untapped richness of the Christian story and also this sort of deeper animist pagan history as well that sort of seems interweaved and inter intermingled so given that this is a time where many of us will be having a very different christmas than maybe we were expecting if we're in lockdown in in the uk or around the world it's really beautiful to to share a bit of time a bit of space like this with people from across the globe and want to say thank you um, and merry christmas to to everybody uh, we will have Next Monday, our last event of the year will be a looking back on 2020, uh, led by Nick, who was in in this session has just left. But um, yeah, so that's the last the last one, and then we'll be coming back in the new year with with more. So as we traditionally do, this is the time where we unmute ourselves and say thank you, Happy Christmas to Rune and to Elizabeth and to everyone else on the call. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Rune. Thanks. Yeah, Happy Christmas, everyone. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Happy Christmas. Christmas. Happy Thanks for inviting Christmas. me. Thank you. Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas, which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership. Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the Explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live Sensemaking, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our Academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training, Then on Thursday, we have our Connection Gym. And the Sense Makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the Wisdom Gym. 
The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense-making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.